Today was our sixth full day of exploring, and it was the last day. Uh, on the following day, on Sunday, we would get up and hop on the plane and head back to our to our homes. Uh, but this was a very fun day. Uh, we visited En Gedi, and I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments. We visited Masada, and I've got some cool, I think, some cool pictures and uh, some videos to show you. And we also had supper on this day in Gehenna. <laughs> and uh, so I'll show you a picture there, talk a little bit about that. Um, and like I said, then the following morning, uh, we did get up and get on the plane and head, head back. And in some ways, it was good to be heading back home. And in other ways, I really wished that this trip just could have kept on going because there was so much more to explore. Uh, our tour guide did a wonderful job of quickly getting us from one place to the other so that we could experience a lot. Uh, but there's many locations I would have loved to spend some more time in and just uh, do some studying, reflecting, maybe create some, some more content. But anyway, this picture, I took this picture of the cable car that we rode up to uh, the top of Masada. And I took this picture as it was heading back down. Um, so, um, I've got a pretty cool video uh, to show you here in a little bit of our trip up to Masada on that cable car. As we left our hotel on this morning, um, I mean, the elevators had this sign already, uh, but, you know, this was the day that it actually uh, was supposed to be enacted. Uh, it said Shabbat um, lift stops on each floor. And so I assumed that on Saturday, the Sabbath, that they wouldn't even overwork <laughs> their elevators. Um, but uh, but the elevator did not stop on each floor uh, on the Sabbath. And so anyway, I just took this picture because even though the Israelites, uh, the Jews, are not really um, a religious people right now, they're still a lot of, um, there's still quite a bit of the things from the Old Testament that they do comply with, and it is integrated into their society. It's who they are. Um, so we, uh, and honestly, also, as we looked out, and I think we were on the eighth floor. I don't see a sign on that elevator, um, but I believe we were on the eighth floor. Um, as we looked out our eighth floor window down onto you know the buildings and the traffic previously, I mean you saw the video that I you may have seen the video that I previously created of Bethlehem, you know, with all of those vehicles and horns honking and everything else. Well, that's what it looks like in Jerusalem. It's just a big city, lots of people. the The highways aren't big enough to handle all of the traffic. It's that kind of stuff. And so it was just bumper to bumper, you know, on the other days. But on this day, the Sabbath, I could have gone out and I could have laid down on any of those roads. Um, I could have laid down in the middle and gone to sleep in theory, you know, I'm saying because there were some vehicles on the road, but not nearly what it was. I mean, it was daylight and dark. Um, the Jews really do try to observe this day when they just are low-key and try to do uh, as little work as possible. Um, we went downstairs uh, on this morning as Kim and I got up. We went downstairs to get some food. And ordinarily, it this place just outdid themselves with the food. The food was delicious. Um, we, I mean, all sorts of you know, the things to eat, and I, I can't remember exactly what uh, what they had there, um, but all I remember is this, the food was delicious, the breakfast and the, uh, I believe we ate supper here um, on the days that we were here. But when we headed down uh, on this morning, on the Sabbath morning, uh, there was nothing hot except black coffee. They had a cappuccino, I think it was a cappuccino machine that I loved getting coffee out of, you know, lots of sugar and things, and I was enjoying that. But uh, but on this morning, they had a covering over that cappuccino machine. They just had simple black coffee. Uh, there were no hot dishes. Um, everything was cold or room temperature, and it looks like it had been prepared the day before. So they were complying with the Sabbath. Um, I think that's a great idea, you know. Uh, I mean, we look at the Ten Commandments, and 
And in reality, I think Christians try to comply with nine of those ten, but the fourth commandment, the longest one, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, um, that's the one we really don't spend too much time really trying to comply with. It's sometimes it's Saturday is, is, I mean, Sunday for us is our Sabbath. It should be our Sabbath, the day of rest, the day of worship, the day of spiritual rejuvenation. But uh, I'm telling you, all, I, all I'm telling you is we were busy on this day. We did get on the bus. We did travel. But as I looked out at the culture and what the Jews were doing on this day, I thought how incredible it would be if we really as Christians tried to comply with the Sabbath Whatever day that is, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, for me, Sunday is a busy day, you know, but what would it be like if there was one day of the week where we tried to do as little as possible? Uh, so we made our way from Jerusalem to Masada. Now, when you're looking, you're looking at this map right now, uh, you see the blue line up at the top. Uh, it starts on you know the sin, uh, left of center, it starts at the Ramada by Wyndham in Jerusalem. We started there, and we uh, went through a tunnel and then down into the Jordan Valley. And really, it is it is down. I think Jerusalem sits up about 2,500 feet. I think it's about 2,500 feet. Uh, you could check me on that. Uh, but the Dead Sea is 1,400 feet. 1400 feet below sea level and so that's like what is it half a mile three quarters I think probably three quarters of a mile that we lose as we travel uh, that distance from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River we go down you know up and down but it's primarily down about three quarters of a mile so anyway so we went and made our way toward Masada now if you look at this map if you see the the video of me if you look to my left, to the left of me, uh, you see Metsada. Um, that's Masada. That's where we were headed. But uh, what we saw first was uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Now, I talked about that in a previous video uh, when we went to the Israeli Museum and we went uh, to see all of those, so many of those scrolls that were discovered. Um, they were discovered here. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered here in the Qumran National Park. So um, we didn't stop here. And I, I don't know that this is the national park. I just know that as we were just continuing to drive, because we didn't stop here, our tour guide said, oh, and by the way, out there is where the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And so I just panned my camera around really quick and just snapped this picture. So this is in the general area of, uh, of where that is. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, in 1947, a shepherd uh, I, I think a shepherd boy was in this area, and the story is is that he was throwing rocks uh, from the valley floor, throwing rocks up into uh, the cave entrances, and there's lots of cave entrances around here. Um, you know, I suppose as he's just a boy, he's, uh, you know, just seeing, hey, you know, am I good enough aim to get this rock into that hole there on the side of the cliff? Well, one rock entered a cave and uh, apparently he heard the sound of cracking pots i don't know the rest of the story but the rest of this from him but the rest of the story is it's one of the greatest archaeological finds of the 20th century uh, the whole book of isaiah the whole book not just a little bit all of isaiah was found and at least fragments of every other book of the old testament was found in these in this place in pots um, every other Old Testament book except Esther Esther was was not discovered here it was not in one of these places and all of the documents dated back to 200 years before Jesus walked the earth until the end of the first century and so it looks as if there was a group uh, that the, the, that were here in these caves and they wanted to preserve their documents and so the apparently the dry arid uh, area kept those documents from uh, decomposing 
and so the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Now, the, a cool thing is that we have had Hebrew documents of the Old Testament, and they've been passed down through the years. They've been copies of copies, and so it was... It was interesting to have those documents and see, okay, how closely do they align with something that we know is 2,000 years old? These documents that are clearly 2,000 years old, how different, what changes have happened in this time? And from the story that I've read, the the, the changes, the, 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 you know, the, the errors that's kind of slipped in, were very minuscule. There was hardly any at all to speak of. Uh, like Adrian Rogers used to say, it was like a thimbleful, you know, of, of uh, mistakes that were discovered. But getting these documents, we were able to get even a clearer picture of what was actually written by those Old Testament prophets and writers. So I'm telling you, this is huge. The Dead Sea Scrolls was a huge find, and it was in this area. So we did not stop here. We continued south, and um, I uh, just wanted to take out uh, my camera and actually take a video. Um, you when I, I, you saw it, so let me just explain this video before I hit play. I took this video on a ride to Masada, and when I looked out the window to my left, now I'm looking out to the right right here, I'm looking to the mountain, but when I looked out to my left, you can see the Dead Sea and the mountain range beyond that, the mountain range beyond that. It was just a little bit north of this area in, on that mountain range, just a little bit north of the mountain range on the other side, and you're going to see it here in just a second, on the other side of the Dead Sea, that was called Mount Nebo, and that's where Moses got to look at the promised land, and then God took his life and buried him. And so we're going to see that. Let me, let me hit play. So uh, this, we're, we're heading south toward Masada. This is me looking out the bus to my right, and you just see some caves, uh, some cave entrances. I don't know if that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I, I've heard that there were just tons of cave entrances around here. But let me show you this video. There were, because what happened here in the, uh, in the Judea Desert there's the Dead Sea and the mountain range on the other side, and just a little bit farther to the left, which is north. Um, that would have been where Moses went up on the mountain and where he looked out over the promised land, and then God took him. So as we continued heading farther south, uh, here the blue line goes down to En Gedi, or Ein Gedi. Um, and uh, we stopped here at this place for about 20 to 30 minutes. What's significant about En Gedi or En Gedi? This is where King Saul was pursuing David. Now, remember, I said that there are caves in you know these er in these areas, lots of caves. Well, it, this is where King Saul was pursuing David, and we're told in the biblical account in uh, is it uh, First Samuel, I believe that he went into, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself, and David was farther back in the cave, and unknowing to King Saul, David cut off a portion of Saul's robe in the cave. It happened here in En Gedi. Um, this is also the place where Saul, not knowing what had happened, uh, was out, and David uh, yelled to him uh, from, from one of these areas and let him know that he could have taken his life, but he chose not to. Um, this is also at En Gedi, uh, and this was a very rare occasion. I got a little too close to these guys. Uh, I was the closest one. I, I shouldn't have done it. I've seen videos of people that get too close to wildlife, and then the wildlife comes after them. But I just wanted to get a good video. This was a very rare occasion where we got to see some, I, I believe they're called ibexes. Uh, they're wild goats that actually have the ability to climb trees. So let me show you a video that I took. Here it is. Okay, so we continued heading south. We got back onto the bus and continued heading south. 
Um, and you see on this blue line that to get from Jerusalem down to Masada, it would have been about an hour and a half. This is just something I snagged from Google. I don't know how long it actually took us, but this says it would be about an hour and a half trip. So we finally got down to Masada, and this was crazy cool uh, because I'd heard about this place for decades and uh, couldn't believe that I was finally here. Herod the Great, um, who was the one that was reigning when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, built two palaces for himself at the top of this butte, at the top of this you know, flattened area around 37 BC to 31 BC. So this would have been you know, roughly 30 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Herod built two palaces for himself up on the top of this mountain. I'm going to show you what it looks like here in just a second. In 70 AD, so this is 40 years, 35, 40 years after Jesus ascends to heaven, in 70 AD, the Romans came and defeated the Jews and destroyed their temple, not leaving one stone on another. And a large number of Jews, almost a thousand, fled to this fortress, Masada, for safety. The Romans built a massive siege ramp because they couldn't just go up. You know, it, they couldn't just go up because as they got closer, they were targets for rocks and you know arrows and everything else that the Jews could send down to them. So they had to get something that would enable, the Romans had to get something where they could have a group of soldiers all at once go in and try to overtake the Jews. And so what they did is they built a massive siege ramp that is still present. In fact, I took a picture and a video, and I'll show that to you in just a second, of the siege ramp um, to invade this fortress in, I believe it was 72 or 73 AD. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, said that almost all of the Jews, rather than being overtaken by the Romans who did use that siege ramp to penetrate Masada and to break in, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, said that almost all the Jews committed suicide rather than being taken captive by the Romans, and it happened in this place. So, what I did is I took a video of the cable car to the top of Masada. I thought this would be fun. Hope you enjoy it. It takes us just you know, about 30 seconds or so, and we'll be on the way. And we're off. <laughs> Look at that square rock formation. Um, that is what the Romans built um, in 71 and 72 AD uh, when they were surrounding Masada. They're still there. And it's getting farther. <laughs> there is a trail that you can walk up to the top of Masada, but it was crazy hot, and uh, I would have liked to have done that, but a lot of exercise, and I would have been drenched with sweat by the time I got to the top. Okay, we'll let you have here and you can walk free. Okay, I'll take it. Now, we're going to be up here. We got a rope ladder. Halfway there. Oh, see the Dead Sea out there. Ah, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. That would be fun to walk down. I, I 
guys have not taken any pictures. Oh, you'll get some good ones up here. Yeah, wait till uh, yeah, wait, 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 find out. Was this slipping? Yeah, it's a cable. I wonder if they have a zip line here. Are the little guys up there getting That would not be fun. The zip line would not be fun. It wouldn't be fun to zip line? No, no, thank you. I think I would throw up and then you could push me over. That's where we came from. All right. So this is my view from the top. Uh, you can see the the two rock squares down below. Um, you can see the rock square that is to the left center of the picture. Uh, that was uh, those rocks were put there by the Romans uh, whenever they came in and they surrounded this mountain. And then there's the rock square in the center, just north of, of center, uh, right from where we came, um, began our journey on the cable car. Uh, these squares were 2,000 years old. Uh, they've been set up, and in fact, they surround this mountain. And I'll show you a few others. Um, let's go to the next picture. This is a picture I took of the Dead Sea from the top of Masada. It's just breathtaking. It was it was hot, but I'm telling you it was beautiful. And again, this is this is from Masada looking north. Now, the range of mountains on the other side of the Dead Sea um is again that's the mountain range that the Israelites would have walked between whenever they were coming up and Joshua was getting them ready to cross the Jordan River to go in and take the land they would have walked between the Dead Sea and um, the, that mountain range they would have walked in that area as they went north and then whenever the Dead Sea ends and you have the Jordan River they would have gone just a smidgen north and that's where Joshua took them over. Um, also, north of the Dead Sea, as I pointed out a while ago, on that mountain range is where God told Noah that, not Noah, God told Moses that he could go up and look at the promised land, but he wouldn't be able to take it um, because he had sinned and not obeyed God in um, striking the rock and not speaking to the rock. So let's go to the next one. This is just a, a, a picture of what it's thought the Roman siege tower would look like. Of course, the thing was wooden. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's it would have deteriorated over time. And so uh, we don't know exactly what it would look like, but it would have looked something like that. It, it would have been very tall. There was something on the end that would... Uh, ram into uh, one of the, the walls, the gates, um, the wooden walls, the gates, and uh, also, you know, they, they would have had a place up there to protect those Roman soldiers on the top as they sent arrows uh, with fire, pitch and fire on the end of those arrows to try to burn down the wooden gate that was blocking them. Uh, but this is the, the siege tower. But you saw how tall Masada is. You can't build a siege tower that tall. It's just impossible. Um, so what they did is they built a ramp. We're going to see that in just a second. I took this video 
of the siege ramp as viewed from the top of Masada. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk from where I am, look through that window, and you're going to see the siege ramp below me to the left. Here we go. There's the siege ramp. Of course, erosion has happened over the last 2,000 years, um, but that was the siege ramp. You can only imagine how long it took them to build that and how many how many Roman soldiers would have died as they were getting up close dumping dirt dumping rocks and the Israelites the Jews above them are shooting down arrows or throwing down rocks on them um, but they built that siege ramp so that they could take that that uh, siege tower up that ramp and then attack the wall so that they could penetrate it and get inside and get the Jews out. This is, I just thought it was a cool picture. Um, I saw the uh, Israeli flag and the Dead Sea out there uh, beyond it. And another thing that I'll say is the Dead Sea is the lowest body of water on the face of the earth. It is 1400 feet below sea level. But if you look in the back of your Bibles and look at the map of the, of Israel and the Dead Sea um, and if you look at that picture and just see the shape of the Dead Sea and then if you go to Google or someplace some satellite picture recent satellite picture that looks down on the Dead Sea you'll see that the 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 shape of it has changed uh, the middle part of it is actually not really water anymore it's land it's, it's kind of separated into two basic parts the reason is is the dead sea play on words is dying the dead sea is dying um, the reason is is that so much of the jordan river is being diverted you know because of uh, cities and places upstream that need water and so they're siphoning off water from the jordan river and the Dead Sea is not getting the water that it needs. And I think it's lost like 70 feet or so. And even as we were making our way up uh, in the bus ride from Jerusalem to Masada, as we would look over, uh, we would see um, houses that had piers that would have gone out over the water, onto the water. Uh, the pier, you would think the pier is built over the water so that the, the person can walk out on the pier and stick their feet down in the water. Well, the water was like a football field away from that pier because the water levels are going way down. So ordinarily, the Dead Sea years ago would have taken up much more of this picture. Um, but again, the Dead Sea is dying. After spending some time at Masada, um, we went to uh, a place where some of the people in our group actually got into the Dead Sea. Um, Kim and I, Kim had already been in the Dead Sea. She came to Israel before we got married, and uh, Kim cannot swim, but she got out in the Dead Sea and she couldn't sink to save her life. Uh, because it is so saturated with salt that nothing can live in it and you cannot sink. Um, but uh, yeah, it's no fun having salt all over you. And so Kim and I just kind of hung out. We spent some time together as the rest of them were out there in that very, very, very hot sun uh, and down there in that salt water. So um, yeah, so this is one of the things we did. From here, uh, we went back, and actually we spent quite a bit of time on Masada and then at the Dead Sea. I think we were there at the Dead Sea for maybe an hour and a half, two hours, something like that. But everybody was just exhausted after being out in the sun, so we came back to the hotel. And then our tour guide took us out uh, this evening, and uh, she said, Hey, I've got a great restaurant. Let's all get together. Let's have... A, a group time, just enjoying each other's company before we take off, before y'all take off. 
So we hopped on the bus again and went out for our last meal together as a group. And this was a very nice restaurant and it had some delicious food. And I noticed the beauty outside. You know, I took a picture because it was, I think it was almost ceiling to floor glass. And so I took this picture as I was sitting at my table looking out the window. You can see all of the lush greenery, and this is so rare over in Israel, unless you're in the Jordan Valley or unless you're up in the, this, the area around Galilee. This is just rare, and so I took a picture, and I wondered, where are we? You know, I wondered where we were, and so I looked at my phone, and this is kind of blurry because I didn't have good cell coverage over there, plus um, it just... I don't know, it was a lot of pixelated uh, in this area, but we're in that blue dot uh, in the picture. We're in the blue dot. And if you look, see the greenery, that's what my phone was aimed at, all that greenery. If you look over to one of the streets, it says Hinnom Valley, Hinnom Valley. This was Gehenna. I just I thought that was so amazing, so incredible that something now that's so beautiful has such a dark past. This is where the Jerusalem garbage dump was. And before that, this is where Manasseh and others sacrificed their children in the fire to the God of Moloch, to, to Moloch. And this is a place that was so dark with its history of child sacrifice and child sacrifice spoke of death and it spoke of blood and it spoke of terror and it spoke of uh, no hope and it spoke of no love and all of these things and more. Jesus said, you know what? That's a great picture to kind of paint a picture in your mind of what hell is like. And so sometimes whenever you see the word hell in the New Testament and Jesus is speaking, sometimes it's the, the word Gehenna. It's not literally hell. It's actually the word Gehenna. It's this place. Um, I just thought that was so crazy. The food was delicious. It was green and everything else. But just thinking about what had happened in this valley uh, so many years ago, so, so that Jesus himself, God in the flesh, said, do you want to know what hell is like? It's like the stuff that has happened in this place in Gehenna. What we did after this was we headed back to the uh, Ramada where we spent our last night in Israel. And after spending our last night here, we hopped on a plane on Sunday. Uh, we headed to Tel Aviv, uh, where we did catch our plane, um, and uh, headed back. I think we went back through Paris. Our flight took us back through uh, Paris, so we went to Charles de Gaulle Airport, had a little bit of a layover, and then came back, I think, uh, through Detroit and then into Lexington Bluegrass Airport. Um, but since the flights were our responsibility, we had to get ourselves to Israel. That was part of our expense. Um, and, uh, you know, so then, you know, they, they would take care of it when we got there, um, if, if I remember correctly. But we, but one of the things that I do know is all of us went back to the airport at different times. You know, there were different planes taking different people to different locations. And so we went a little earlier than some other people. Uh, we built some relationships with some of these other folks. So we were able to hear from them um, that our taxi cab ride from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv was uneventful. You know, everything was perfect. Everything was fine. We made our way back to the airport and we were fine. But the group behind us said that they were diverted. Their taxi cab driver diverted them because missiles were being fired, in, fired into Israel. So the cab driver took a different route that, uh, that he believed uh, to be safer. Um, it, it just happens over there. And I'm telling you that, that there are people that are against Israel right now and what they are doing in Gaza to try to get rid of Hamas. But I'm telling you that if you were over in Israel, 
it, it's just a different world. And they live with the notion that at any moment, missiles could be fired in from quite a few different directions because they are surrounded by enemies. Surrounded by enemies, some of which want them dead. I'm telling you, this place is not only beautiful, and while these people need the Lord Jesus, they need to trust in their Messiah, in the one who did come to redeem them. Um, I'm telling you, these are special people, and these are people that we should be praying for. We should be praying for them and pray that, uh, that God would be, bring peace back to Jerusalem and bring peace to Israel and call them to himself. So I hope that uh, this has been helpful and enjoyable as we've talked about this trip that Kim and I took. It was certainly a fun trip for us, and I'm telling you, if you ever get a chance to visit Israel, do it. And you may say, oh, it doesn't sound safe. Well, you know, nothing is really safe. I live just a couple of miles from Interstate, Floor, Interstate 4 here in the center of Florida. Uh, I think a couple of years, on average, one person died every mile and a half. And yet, I still drive on Interstate 4. Um, I felt so safe over in Israel. And even knowing that missiles had been fired in to uh, Israel um, so that our the group behind us had to divert, I would still go to Israel again if I had the chance. There are still people going over there. Um, I'm telling you, they're... There are special people, it's a special location, and I just want to encourage you to uh, consider taking advantage of an opportunity if you get a chance to go over and visit Israel. Um, but one thing that I'll, I'll say, and then I'll close, is if, if you get a chance to go to Israel, what I would encourage you to do is get a list of the locations that you're going to be going to. Get a list of those locations, the specific, don't just, I'm not just saying, hey, we're going to be going to Galilee, we're going to be going to Jerusalem. No, get a list of where you're going to be going to. And then with that list, do Bible study before you go. Dig in. I mean, create, maybe you say, okay, we're going to go to Bet Chan. I don't know much about Bet Chan. Right at the top of a page, Bet Chan, and then do a Bible study and just fill that page up with all of the things that you can learn about what happened in this place. What were the, the significant events that took place here? So that when you go over, you're not just looking at things and saying, oh, I kind of remember the story that happened here. No, when you go over, you need to have those things in your mind so that you can even more appreciate those sites that you go and see. So that's just my two cents. Once again, I hope you have enjoyed this time together uh, as I've shared this trip with you. And hopefully someday you're able to take the trip yourself.